I think everybody knows you. And we appreciate besides, you. Besides the people in this room, everybody knows me. <laughs> yep, I'm Jack Stewart. I am an AMP IA. You already know that. And I also teach part time at a AMP school. Not that I'm smarter than anybody here. I just have been doing this stuff for a little while. And uh, I thought I'd come over and uh, I, I get questions all the time. People call me, I don't know why, I'm no expert, but people call me, they think I'm an expert. And how do you do this and how do you do that? And I'm always glad to help people out, especially taking care of these old airplanes. I love these old things. They're the best airplane in the world, I think. Wish I still had mine back. But anyway, one of the problems that guys have is oil leaks. Well, they're air-cooled engines, guys. Air-cooled engines are going to leak because of the heating and cooling cycle. It's different than a liquid-cooled engine like it's in your car. It takes longer for things to warm up and longer, a lot longer for things to cool down in a liquid cooled engine. So the expansion and contraction is not near as bad as it is in air cooled engines. I don't care if you're talking Lycoming, Continental, Franklin, Harley Davidson's. We don't want to even talk about Japanese motorcycles. I don't know how they keep them sealed up. But anyway, all that stuff will leak oil eventually. You put an engine together and it'll be fine for a while, but eventually it starts leaking because everything heats and cools. So I'm going to demonstrate here after a while about how to seal up some of the leaks. But one of the things, Randy and I are going to try something here. I wanted to do this, but I wanted to do it so we could put it on the internet because this is a real common problem, these things leaking oil. And it's real common that if, sorry, you guys can't see if you want to move up. I don't know. Anyway, we're going we're gonna to get the camera down here, and we're going to get it up there on the board. So I've got a 150 case, and I got a cylinder here. It's cracked right alongside the valve guide. And after we took it off, we found it was cracked from the exhaust valve seat out. I'm not going to mention the company that done this, oh, but I know what they done. They drove them valve guides out cold and drove the new ones in cold. The book says heat them up. If you don't heat them up, this is one piece cast aluminum. And if you don't heat them up to normalize things, that's what happens. Uh, so I've seen them guys drive valve guides out and take an eighth of an inch of aluminum with them, which the cylinders trash them. So anyway. What's the proper way to heat them, Jack? Heat them in an oven. Okay. And the book says unlike a video that's on YouTube that says 250 degrees, the book says 600. Are you ready? Okay. The first thing we got to do, if your engine's been together for a long time and the push rod tubes start leaking, well, you don't have any choice. You got to pull the push rod tubes. So I got this fancy little tool here that was whipped up in Jack Stewart's machine shop. It was a copy of somebody else's tool. And the pushrod tubes have a top and a bottom. The top flange is bigger than the bottom flange. And it won't go down through the hole if you try to put the top one down through there. You got to start with the bottom one. Well, in order to get them out,
use a pair of channel locks and you grab it like this. <laughs> oh, maybe you don't because that's what happens if you use a pair of channel locks and grab it like this. These are thin wall aluminum. Oh, well, we can always use vice grips then, can't we? Yeah, we better not do that either. And these things, if your engine's been together for a long time, these things are pretty tough to get out. So, we got this tool. Like I said, it's a copy of a tool that someplace. There's two or three different tools to use, but if you'll notice, this rib right here will go down inside the pushrod tube and hook on this round indented part that's in the tube where the rubber goes. It's real simple. So it goes down in here. You see it on the big board here. You hold it up here and it goes down in there and then you just push it down and it locks in that groove and all you do is tighten this up and it'll pull that push rod tube right up out of there. No matter how tough they are. Well, this seal has to come off in order to get the push rod tube out. If you don't want to take the push rod tube all the way out, you don't have to. But you raise it up enough to get the seal off and you put your new seal on. Susan has a whole box full of them. You don't need this anymore. You can take it back out. And you can see this top one's cracked. Now, this is a 150. The push rod seals on a 150 are the same size. So it don't make any difference. But on a 165, the top one is smaller. Don't put the top one down here in the bottom because all you're doing is creating another leak. And also, I found that the top one is a little bit thinner. So if you move the smaller, thinner one down here and the fatter, thicker one up here, and you put the pushrod tube in, it's not going to seal. Or it might be all right for a little while. So you put the pushrod tube in, put the rubber on the bottom, and put it on down in here. Now, never put a seal in dry. My rule of thumb is I'll lubricate the seal with the same type that it runs in. If I'm working on an engine, it'll be engine oil. If I'm working on struts, it'll be 5606 or whatever the lubrication happens to be that that seals in all the time. And normally what happens is you get this brand new seal down in here and I always try to make sure I get the top started first. So I get the top started because the excess seal, once the top started, the excess seal comes out here on the bottom. Remember now, we're working in an airplane, the engine's still in there, and sometimes the exhaust is in the way, the intake's in the way. I mean, you don't have to take that stuff off and put them seals in. So I've got a little plastic pry bar, for lack of a better word. But today we're gonna use a screwdriver and you just gently put that seal down in there. It's like you're putting a tire on a bicycle, guys. Just put that seal down in there. Now you want to gently do this because you don't want to tear up the seal or you definitely don't want to mess up this case on the engine. Once it's started, uh-oh, where'd my other tool go? <coughs> Well, shoot. Oh, there it is. I made this. I just turned it out of a piece of brass. And it's right off the Stinson uh, CD that you can get. There's nothing to it. I mean, you just a couple of turns here. But this part here fits in the pushrod tube. And then this part here is small enough. It captures the tube, but it takes it right on down in the head. So... Just a few gentle taps. Like I say, it's lubed up nice with oil. So just a few gentle taps. Seats it right in there. 
you want to make sure that it don't roll up on you like an o-ring you want to make sure it goes down in there flat now if you've got some extra money and you really want to go for all out here you can buy this tool I think Chris Collum now is selling these things and I think they're going for about 200 bucks a piece oh if I can get it started this will work good on 150 and 165s so you can see the idea here now the advantage to having this tool is I can lean against that tool with my chest while I've got my screwdriver going pushing this seal down in the case that's the main advantage if you're having trouble getting the seal in the case this tool is great but if you've got this tool just have a buddy as you're working this seal in have a buddy put some pressure on that it don't take a whole lot once you get the seal started and it's lubed good with oil it'll slide right in there guaranteed so you definitely have to have something to get them out with besides these things <coughs> because all these things do is this and now this is junk because if it's squeezed together tight enough here the push rod can rub on the inside of it and create metal in your engine of course if it rubs bad enough it'll wear right on through and then you'll have a heck of a leak in your engine and wonder where it come from the next place that I found that these things leak is really difficult to fix because you have to pull the engine out to fix it and that's this main gasket back here where the accessory case goes on for some reason they get the leak in there and you have to pull the engine out you have to pull the big gear off the crank to get the accessory case off and put a new gasket in there hopefully all yours is sealed up good now a couple of notes here do not use silicone sealer in fact in the 70s Lycoming and Continental both come out with service bulletins don't use silicone sealer around our engines I had to show that to a guy I pulled a cylinder off of this 172 and it had red RTV all the way around the cylinder and I said what in the world is this well that's the way we done it back in the day not any day I know of Continental was the first one to come out and say don't use silicone sealer in their engines and I went over to my toolbox and in the bottom drawer I've got some paperwork and I pulled out the service bulletin well that that was later when we done this engine that's the way it was done and I said no it wasn't the date 1974 don't use silicone sealer around engines I walked into a shop one day they had a I think it was a 421 with twin turbocharged Continentals in it and they've been fighting an oil leak in this one engine and this mechanic trainee I walked in right when he said boy that won't leak anymore there was a block off plate underneath the turbocharger for some kind of accessory that didn't happen to be used on this engine and I looked and the silicone sealer was squeezed out about a half an inch all the way around that plate and I said don't you think that if it's squeezed out that much on the outside it's squeezed out that much on the inside oh it'll be all right that engine ran 60 hours and cooked the crankshaft and of course he blamed the engine company but anyway so don't use silicone sealer now something else I want to I have people calling me I got a stuck valve do you know the Wyoming rope trick yep rarely ever use it but I know it you guys familiar with what I'm talking about go get you some rope stick it in a spark plug hole get this get the piston down and run you about 10 feet of rope in there 
and then gently pull the prop around to where the piston takes that rope and pushes it up against the valve. If you're a hundred miles away from home or whatever, then yep, use that trick. Spray some PB blaster in there around the valve stem, some around the outside of the valve stem up here, and unstick the valve. You may have to do it two or three times. That may get you home. But the minute you get home, take the cylinder off. I know a guy, he had a, a 140 Cessna. About every 50 hours, he was having to unstick a valve. And I said, why don't you take the cylinder off? Oh, that's, that's a lot of trouble, man. That's a lot of work taking that cylinder off. Uh, how many people was out on the ramp yesterday watching Dave James change a cylinder in an airplane? On the ramp. It's not that difficult. You didn't pick up a wrench. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't notice you didn't have any of these. Did you? Okay. Uh, here again, guys, these are cylinder base nut wrenches, and they're made right off that Stinson CD. Uh, in fact, you can still read Craftsman, I think, on these wrenches. Yep. A 5 eighths and a 9 sixteenths. You showed the guys yesterday in the presentation using the snap on torque adapter. Do what? Snap on torque adapter. Snap on torque adapters? Long, yeah. They work better than those. those don't well, I don't know. I've got plenty of use out of these. Look at that one. Yeah. Uh, I think I was working on a 550 Continental. They work real good on Continentals, too. Because I always said that. Continental copied a lot of their stuff right off of Franklin. Franklin was so far ahead of Continental, it wasn't funny, and everybody else. But yeah, these are made off that CD. Uh, here's another little wrench. I don't think it's on the CD, but if you ever split the case on one of these, you'll have to have this because it goes inside here for those case nuts, and then you can torque it back because your torque wrench is in line with the nut. That's the whole idea about cylinder base nut wrenches. This crazy stuff that we cook up. What's that? You need the same work. Uh, no, Randy, I don't. Thank you. Couple of more things. I didn't invent this, I just made it. I don't know where I got the idea. All it is is a 5 8 wrench head welded on to a Harbor Freight pry bar. And you need to bleed the lifters down to set your valve clearance. The book says 40 thousandths. Well, if you don't bleed the lifters down, you'll get a false reading. A guy sent me a picture of his rocker arms. Somebody made a wrench. They watched my video and they made one of these things. and. They didn't round the corners off. They left the corners sharp on that wrench head. And he hooked the rocker arm and pulled down on it. You don't want to pull down like you're prying a nail out. You want to gently push down on it. And you can watch the rocker arm move. You can watch the gap grow between the valve and the rocker arm, which is the whole idea. You want to bleed the oil out of the lifter. So once you get the oil bled out of the lifter, then you check your valve clearance. Well, he didn't round those off, and he really skinned up a couple of rocker arms. And the guy was concerned about it, and I said, yeah, you need to be concerned. That's, you've set up a stress point in that rocker arm. And through the years, we've kind of had rocker arm problems anyway. Well, I revised my tool. This puts less strain on the rocker arm. Hooks the rocker arm here, and then back here where the adjuster is, it puts less strain on the rock arm. One side, and you do the other side. Okay. Come on in, ladies. You can sit down. There's seats. So I think now somebody has a tool similar to this that they're selling for a couple hundred bucks. Anyway, shoot, I just welded this thing up in my garage one day. And I had a cylinder sitting there with some rocker arms on it, 
And I said, well, it needs to be about that long this way. Well, right away, Randy and I made a new video. And somebody said, well, how long is this and how big is that? And I said, oh, I don't know. This is some old scrap metal I had laying around. So then we had to go back. Did we measure it and put the measurements on? I don't, I don't remember. That, no. But anyway, if you want to see it, there it is. That's what I use now. So, let's see. There was a couple more things I wanted to say. What was it? My, my whole point about the cylinders is there's no need to hesitate about pulling the cylinder. I think it's about $35 worth of gaskets if you put all new gaskets in. It don't take very, very long. And if you do it by the book, remember, you put the cylinders on, you bolt the intake log on without the cylinders being tight. It's very important you do that. And then you torque the cylinders up once you've got the intake log bolted on because it's one piece. That's one thing that Continental did improve. They made three separate pieces joined by rubber tubes. So then you torque the cylinders down. Then you take the intake log back off. Put the gaskets on. Yeah? If you were just going to pull one cylinder, would you loosen the base nuts on the other two cylinders? and then tighten the intake log or just... No. Yeah, if you just take one cylinder off, sure, bolt your intake log to the, well, all three of them, really. You're going to bolt the intake log to all three of them and torque it down, snug her down pretty good, and then torque that one cylinder, take your intake log back off, put the gaskets on it, put it back up there and torque it down for good. You, you don't loosen the other two cylinders? No, no, no need to. I never have, and I never have had any problems. One more point. I don't. I'm just asking <laughs> If you want to, I guess it won't hurt anything, but I've never found a need to uh, do that. I've had a lot of problems with exhaust studs and exhaust nuts coming loose. In fact, uh, Randy's plane, I think the last annual I'd done on it, Two or three of the studs was gone. A couple of the nuts was gone. Wow, I put that engine together. I know it was torqued like it was supposed to be. Well, I no longer trust the torque specs for the exhaust manifold. And I advise you to order some Lycoming style, I should have brought one, a Lycoming style exhaust nut. They're brass, they're about twice as thick as a regular nut and I haven't had one come loose yet. You torque them down. In fact, I hate to say this, I don't use a torque wrench on them. I, I torque them down pretty good with just a good old 3 8 ratchet. I know, I know what the book says, what we're supposed to do, but just like I tell students in school. There's the stuff that I have to teach you, according to the FAA, and then there's the real world. And the difference between guys fresh out of school and guys that's been doing it for 20 years is the experience. So when you get out working in the real world, you find out real quick that things are sometimes different. A lot of times different. We can't always do things by the book in school. I had uh, a couple of years ago sent one exhaust out for rebuild at the AWI, I think it was, and it came back. They did a beautiful job, but they put flanges on that were about twice as thick as the ones on the other side in the original, and those those tall nuts would not um, bottom. The, you couldn't see threads through the nuts, so I had to go back to the thinner ones, the thinner brass. Wow, I haven't run into that problem, but wonder why they've done that. They, they thought flanges. they thought they needed to. They use flanges from a small Continental C eighty five O two hundred. Oh, so they've got them. That's where they use them from. 
and it was great. It's nice thick flanges, not yeah. likely to bend. They're also but slightly bigger diameter. They catch on the push rod trouts trying to put them in. Yeah. And yeah, in fact, I think one of the mufflers on Randy's has got those thick flanges on it because I had to bolt them on and then I had to take the push rod tubes back out, bolt the muffler on and then put the push rod tubes back in because they wouldn't go past. Yeah, yeah, so anyway, well, shouldn't warp. Right. <laughs> uh, you might have considered longer studs. I think that's that's what I would try if I would have been doing it because I'm a firm believer in them Lycoming style nuts. They just they just don't come loose as a general rule. And I don't know why that the exhaust studs and nuts come loose on uh, our Franklins like they do. But they do. So like I said, I use the Lycoming nuts and I have better luck with them. Anything else? My time up? No, you have till 3.30. I have till 3.30? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to start telling jokes or something. So you have till 12.30. 12, lunch is 12.30. My, my daughter don't like my dad jokes, she calls them. <laughs> Where the oil lines come out to go to your oil cooler, that housing there, where do they tend to leak at? I've got a small leak on that somewhere. These oil lines here? One of them goes to the oil cooler and the other one comes back from the oil cooler. Right. But that housing, somewhere there's oil leaking out of my housing. The housing. Oh, your housing itself is leaking? The, where it bolts onto the engine or, or here? They pull over tight in the fittings and crack the housing. Oh, here? Yeah. He's asking where do you normally see them leak in that area? Where do you see that anywhere on that thing leak? Exactly. Where on it do they leak? Yeah. All over. All over. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Dave's right. Uh, I've found that most people on a pipe thread have a tendency to tighten up a pipe thread too tight. And especially these aircraft fittings are aluminum. And you go cranking them down too tight and all you're doing is asking for more trouble. Well, then it's leaking. What's the first thing you want to do? Well, it's a pipe thread. I'll tighten it up a little more. Well, all you're doing is pulling in threads more. Usually the only cure, if you've got aluminum fitting like this leaking, take it off, throw it away, and put you another one on. But uh, these fittings right here don't leak as bad as, here again, guys, you got to remember, some of these engines are 75 years old. Well, most of them ain't been flying that long, but probably 20 years anyway, sitting in an airplane. And that's the big problem is setting. We go out, we go fly, fly around for an hour, have a good time, maybe go to a pancake sausage fly in, go get a hamburger or something, and we go put the plane back in the hangar, and that's where it sets for a week or a month or however long it sets there. And then the next thing, you know, oh, well, let's go fly. So you go out to the hangar and you roll the plane out and you check it all over, some people don't check them over as good as they should. And you fire it up and go flying. Well, you probably didn't notice that there's a teacup full of oil setting down in the bottom of the pan. It's been sitting there condensing. Uh, I've drained oil out of them a couple of times on a cold engine. And that's usually about what you get out. I've got almost a cup full of water out of some engines. Well, yeah, it's water. It's laying down on the bottom of the pan because the oil floats on top of the water. And then we've got a floto pickup for the oil pump, right? What's the worry? Well, if there's water down in the bottom of that engine, look at all the places that there can be water inside here that didn't drain down that far. That's part of the reason we always change our oil hot, right? We go fly the airplane, we come back in to change the oil, we want it hot. He don't have to worry because he's got an oil tank. But the rest of us, we want those contaminants, well, him too, but we want those contaminants suspended in that oil. And hopefully you got it up to 180, 
190 degrees, so you boil water out of the oil in about an hour, right? Takes care of that. And remember, too, that our oil temperature is measured after it goes through the cooler, goes back into the engine. So the oil in the engine itself is probably 200 degrees or so before it comes out and goes to the oil cooler. And if you're smart, you've got a remote oil filter on your engine. Hopefully, if not, that's the first modification I would make on one. Put a remote oil filter on. Catch those dirt, particles, metal, so at the oil change, you can take that filter off and you can cut it apart, and open it up, and look and see what you got. Otherwise, how are you going to know what's going on in that engine? If you got metal particles floating around in the oil, all it's doing is bad things to your bearings, your camshaft, your lifter faces. So a remote oil filter, yeah, I think an Airwolf, last time I checked, is about six or eight hundred bucks. Double that. What is it? Double that now. Everything else is, doesn't surprise me. And when you get the remote oil filter, order a, order a case of filters too because eh, they're almost as hard to get as crankshafts for Franklin. We've had, we've had 110 oil filters on. What, what's that? Those prices are coming down here so don't order a case. Right prices are coming down a little bit. Well, we've had 110s on order for... God, I don't know how long. Where you order them from? Probably, well, AV all Boeing, okay. our airport. That's where they do business at. I've tried to get them to do different. I think Spruce said about the same thing. You got them? You got one tens? <clears throat> we'll be giving you a call. <laughs> we got Cher We got two Cherokees, and they both take one tens. On the topic of condensation, what are your thoughts on leaving a preheater plugged in all winter long? Never. Versus, never. 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 I got, a, I got a good friend of mine. His name's Bob. Him and his brother, of course, he's an old man now, but him and his brother run a certified repair station up by Chicago. All they work on is carburetors and mags. Two little old guys. I mean, they, they can't pick up anything else. No, I shouldn't say that about Bob. He is a, one of the coolest guys. I see him all the time at maintenance seminars. If you mention the fact that you plug in a heater and leave it on all the time, he about beats you with your cane. He says, they send these magnetos to me to overhaul, and he said, I can tell immediately. He calls them Tannis heater, that's a brand name, but he says, I can tell immediately if there's a Tannis heater on that airplane. And for some reason, Bonanza guys like to put them heaters on and they plug them in and leave them on all winter. <coughs> it's the worst thing you can do. It's a good idea to have a heater on an engine. In fact, part of the Airwolf STC says if it's below 40 degrees, you've got to plug the heater in. So if you've got an Airwolf oil filter on your airplane, plug the heater in. Well, a lot of deals, I mean, this is the 21st century. And I know some guys that's got deals rigged up to where they can call their hangar and the heater comes on. I, I don't think there's much to it. Have you got one? You got one, didn't you? No, not yet. Don't worry, he'll have one. My daughter says he's an electric nerd. <laughs> she don't mean that in a derogatory way either. Uh, I know several guys now that's got, I don't know if it's tied into the phone system or exactly how it works, but all they do is dial up this number, dedicated, and the heater comes on. Well, by the time they get to the airport and they get a pre-flight done, the engine's warmed up. But don't turn that thing on and leave it on all winter. What, is it, what does it do? What are the negative effects? Well, it creates condensation in your engine. Okay. Now, Franklin's are not too bad because that round part that the starter gear goes in, that's where the rubber hose or aluminum, whatever kind of hose you got coming out of that, that's the highest part of the engine. So the condensation will go up there. Hopefully it'll go out the hose and it won't stay in the engine. But Continentals have always had a problem. Uh, that's, here again, the Bonanza guys, 
because a high point in a, in a continental like 520, 540 is the magnetos. Where's the condensation go? Right up there in the magnetos. I don't know if you've bought a set of slicks lately. You used to be able to buy a set of slicks, the whole rig for about 1500 bucks. Huh. Now one magneto is about $1,800. I just put one on a, a 0320. And a guy over at Jacksonville is building a champ. He said he'd give $3,000 for the mags and the wires. And I said, well, if you did, you got took. But anyway, you don't want to be buying stuff like that. So don't leave those heaters plugged in. Uh, Bonanza guys, too, they learned, they call it the Bonanza trick. They back them in the hangar, and they loosen up the oil cap so the moisture will come out. Well, if you've flown for an hour or more in a Franklin, if you've flown for an hour or more, you've cooked most of the uh, water out of the oil. Just leave it sealed up. Back in the hangar, it'll be all right. But yeah, no, don't leave them. Don't leave them stupid heaters plugged in. So Jack, if you have the preference of using a Tannis type heater that attaches to the engine, or a I think they call it a milk house type heater that's just ducted up underneath with a blanket over it, which would you? Prefer? I use both. Okay. My Stinson had a, a heating pad on the on the pan sump, and I'd plug it in. And I also had a little milk house heater. And I made this tube to go right up in the back of the cowling. Just smash it down about like that, stick it in the cowling. Uh, so I didn't have the luxury of calling my hangar. So by the time I got my pre-flight done, usually the engine was nice and warm. Uh, I could see 100, 110 on the temperature gauge. If the, I can see the temperature gauge come up a little bit, I know there's heat in the engine, then I can go ahead and fire it up. Another thing about heating your engine, guys, Especially for you guys that listen to the old timers and think all you can run is straight weight oil. I know, I was one of them hard-headed guys back in the 70s. When that multi-weight oil came out, that stuff can't work. I mean, shoot, I built race cars. We ran 50 weight racing oil. You can't be 10 weight one minute and 40 weight the next minute. That won't work. Shoot, what are you trying to fool? Well, then this fool got a lesson or two. And I learned that those multi-weight oils is one of the best things that ever happened to us in this region of the United States anyway. Now, if you're someplace that stays pretty moderate all the time, like Eddie down in Oklahoma, he don't see 30 below like we do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You guys, you guys hopefully don't see the weather we see. But anyway, I run multi-weight oil, and I'm a firm believer in it now, or I didn't used to be. But if you've got straight weight oil in your engine, 50 weight. Aeroshell W100 is 50 weight oil. You got 50 weight oil in your engine, you crank it up. There's a question I always ask my students. I teach engines, by the way. I don't teach very many classes, but engines and welding and piston engine related things, ignition, stuff like that. And one of the questions I always ask my students, what's the worst thing you can do to an engine? Start what? Start, start, start it. Throttle. What'd you say? Start it. That's right. Start it. No matter what RPMs, start it. It's been sitting in the hangar for a month, or two or three months, heaven forbid. Been sitting in there, all the oils ran off all the parts. You run that baby out, man, I'm going flying today. Even if you start it up on a dead idle, 750 RPM or 650, whatever you got your oil idle set up, and it lights up, watch that oil pressure gauge. There's another FAA question I don't agree with. There's an FAA question that says, when you start the engine, how long does it take the oil pressure to come up? The FAA answer is 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds. Man, I'm telling you, if I don't have oil pressure almost immediately, I'm finding out why. Well, if it's really cold and you got straight weight oil in there and you haven't heated your engine, 
it's going to take quite a few seconds for that 50 weight oil to circulate through that engine. So the worst thing you can do is start it up. And of course, you run multi-weight oil in your radial. Well, I don't have the radio flying yet. What? It's not flying yet. Oh, yeah. I thought that round motor out there was yours. No. no. <laughs> oh, okay. Who's got the round motor out there? Somebody stole his plane. Somebody stole it? Okay, sorry about that. He just left. <laughs> but anyway, in our in our flat motors, yeah, I run multi-weight oil. So when I start it up, it's 10 weight. And after it gets warmed up, it's 40 weight. And it works. If it's good enough for NASCAR, it's good enough for us, right? <laughs> In fact, most multi-weight oils, there's a couple of exceptions, but most multi-weight oils is some form of synthetic and that synthetic stuff is so slick and stays on our parts a whole lot better than the old straight weight oils I'd never recommend straight weight except for breaking an engine in 50 weight mineral oil break that engine in and then get it out of there Lycoming now say that I keep referring to Lycoming because Sad to say, these guys are not here to advise us anymore. So pretty much what Lycoming Continental says, if they're saying it, then I think we can pretty well take it to the bank. And uh, I think Phillips, some of the Phillips multi-weight don't have any or very little synthetic in it. But everybody else's oils, pretty much 50-50, or you can now get all synthetic oils. There is no, synthetic no? What's that? Exxon was the only one that ever had synthetic in their aviation oil. Phillips or Aeroshell do not have synthetic in their oil. Does not have synthetic in it? Well, that's not what a guy from Aeroshell told me. Well, they also can in their oil, too, and stock. I don't have that check either. The semi-synthetic has got other additives that give it the same effect. Right, it's not a synthetic It's not a synthetic additive. It's another chemical base that does the same thing. Yeah, well, I talked to a guy from... Ah, I talked to a guy from Shell and he said, yeah, almost all multi-weight oils is some part synthetic. Really? I'll be darned. Okay, I stand corrected. But you are correct. What are we talking about? <laughs> so they're not synthetic. At all. No, I have to test them all the time because the camp guard. So I test yeah. present days. And I can tell you lots about oil that you would never believe. I can tell you the oil I would not put in my lawn mower. Okay, speaking of cam guard, we got some up here. Uh, what's your recommendation? Every oil change? Ed Collins got great will tell you to make a makeup oil. I don't do the makeup oil, I'm lazy. Uh, 12.6 ounces per quart. I do two ounces because once again I'm lazy. I'm not going to make it 1.6. They're going to need to put it in there every time you have one. We've done test both ways and it comes out the same as always. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. I recommend it. Like I was telling him in Oshkosh a few years ago, I met the guy that formulated this stuff and of course, it didn't take but about 30 seconds for him to be talking over my head, but it seemed like he knew what he was talking about. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he told me he worked for Exxon. And Exxon used to put it in their oil, and then they quit. We're going to save 10 cents a quart on oil, so we're not going to put it in there anymore, or however much you're going to save. So anyway, he left the company. And I knew he went out on his own, but he went with these guys here. Is he an advisor or what? He just... He just <laughs> so who who bottles this stuff for you? Jack Daniels or... No, we do it. You do it yourself? <laughs> great. It's a great experience. You want to come bottle? Some great. Great. I will let you. It's great. 
It, the first 10 balls are fun after that. It's, no. Are you, are you going to be covering some of this? In the yes, I'll be covering all this, yeah. So, Jack, he's going to be covering the details of Cam Guard here after the session. Oh, okay, good, yeah. good, good. I can start talking. You can come up and talk. I'll quit. I told about all the lies I know anyway. So let's see, is there anything else I want to go over here? Yeah. But I want to emphasize again about sticking valves and guys using the rope trick to fix them. Why? Except to get yourself home. Why not pull that cylinder off? See what's going on in there. I was working on the plane that this cylinder was on, and I noticed the exhaust was leaking. Of course, the cylinder's sitting like this, right? And I looked up in there, and I saw that the exhaust was leaking. Well, here again, that's kind of common on air-cooled engines, but you don't want that to happen. As we learn in our young days in old Harley Davidson's, the exhaust gets to leaking. You pull up someplace and shut it off, and that exhaust valve is open, it'll suck in cold air and it'll warp that valve. Same thing happens on these. So, I drop the exhaust. Oh yeah, it will. Sure will. You don't think so? Why not? Cold air can go in there and warp that valve in a heartbeat. Never happened. Oh yeah. Another one of your lines. Okay. <laughs> Are you writing them down? <laughs> like Dale did up in Ice Guys? Shh, shut up. Anyway, I noticed the exhaust leaking and I, I got gaskets for these things. So I pulled the exhaust down. Well, I'm doing an inspection on this airplane, so I'm still inspecting. And I got my little flashlight and I look up in there. Oh no, what is that? And I work in a hangar with a partner and we double check each other's work a lot. I said, hey, Todd, come here. Look up in there and tell me what you see. Oh, it's a crack. I was, I was afraid you was gonna say that. So I had to call the owner and say, hate to tell you this buddy, but we need a cylinder. Okay, well if we need one. I never put anything on a guy's plane that costs very much money without asking him first. I mean, it's just good practice. Well, some guys will tell you, well, it needed it, we just went ahead and put it on. Well, no, you're talking fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 here. Well, I got the okay and I went ahead and pulled the cylinder off and I happened to look up in there and there's a crack that runs from the exhaust valve seat out to the edge of the cylinder. So it's a good thing that I saw that crack. Not good for his pocketbook, but good thing we saw that crack. So, anything else you want to say? No. <laughs> Jack, I got one thing that will back up the leaks just a little bit. Yeah. And I've seen several times People have their engine apart, they'll paint things up. So tube, your rocket tube, or foot rod tube, if you don't clean the paint off or don't keep from painting around where the gasket goes, you've got a path for a leak there. That paint will conduct that oil just to get in. Yeah. So just, yeah. You know, anybody's doing whatever they want to do to it, if you paint those, make sure you tape them off or yep. clean them back off before you put them. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I don't know how many Lycoming engines, how many Lycoming engines you've seen that's got a row of red silicone down the middle of it where the case splits? No, the guy with the Franklin used all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how many Lycomings I've seen come in and got a big gob of red silicone down the middle of it. God, they could at least use blue. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening to me, folks. Yeah.